I'm just testing my mic. Can everybody hear me? I guess so. Uh, so welcome, folks. Uh, thanks for taking the time to attend this presentation. I'm going to be talking about Windows in an OpenShift world. It's about enabling Windows workloads in OpenShift. All right, let me see how this works. Oh, awesome. So before we start to do this deep divers type presentation, I'd like a show of hands on how many people have used a Linux container? OK, that's almost 100%. Now, how many people have used a Windows container? I am I'm quite surprised. Uh, but it's Antonio, so I'm sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so in many ways, Windows containers are sort of new to the game, even though Microsoft has been working on this for a good five to six years. So let's start with a quick uh, history on Windows containers. There are some differences when you compare them with Linux containers. There are a couple of ways you could run a Windows container. And that differentiation is based on isolation modes. The first mode that people typically think about when you think about containers is process isolation. Process isolation means that you have namespaces, and then you use those namespaces to sort of you know, protect uh, containers from each other for multi-tenancy purposes, et cetera, et cetera. However, Windows has no construct called namespaces. So because of that, they came out with this servo construct, which they call a silo. It's very close to namespaces, but doesn't work exactly in the way a namespace works. So that took care of uh, namespacing. And what do you do about controlling how much resource a particular container is using? To handle this scenario, what they did is they came out, or they didn't even come out. They have a construct called job objects. And a job object can be used to control a set of Windows processes. So they sort of you know, stole that job object concept, and they decided to use it with, uh, for their containers. Um, the other thing with process isolation is, of course, you all know with containers, the kernel is shared. So when the container is running, it is actually sharing the kernel that's on the host. However, a key difference here is that Microsoft claims of giving you no security uh, guarantees for using containers with process isolation and a multi-tenant environment. So to um, get over this, there is also an added restriction in this whole world. The, fa the fact is that your host and container kernel, they have to match. So if you created your container on Windows Server 2019, you can only run it on Windows Server 2019 if you're using process containers. So Server 2016, you have to run it on Server 2016. So to get over these sort of restrictions that you have, what Microsoft did is they said, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll help you and we'll give you security guarantees if you use Hyper-V isolation. So what is Hyper-V isolation? Hyper-V isolation takes virtualization and they basically run the VM in a very highly optimized virtual machine. So what do you mean by a very highly optimized virtual machine? So what they are actually doing is, instead of booting the virtual machine from scratch, uh, which is, you know, you start from real mode, you go to protect, protected mode, 32 bit, then you transition into long mode, and then, you know, there's a whole slew of drivers that you have to deal with, keyboard, video, mouse, and all the other fun stuff. They said, oh, let's try something different. Let's now boot the kernel at a spot where it's already running in long mode, that is 64-bit mode. So that saves a bunch of time. And then what they did is they pared down the device model. So you don't have all the devices you would have in a particular VM in this little you know, highly optimized virtual machine that they're running. So that's a huge advantage because you know, what we're used to with containers is if I you know, do Podman and, and just run a container, it comes up immediately. So they're, they were trying to get as close as possible they could with that, even though they were using virtualization. So that's the reason for all this optimization. And with that, you have another advantage. Your host kernel and your container kernel, 
need and match because, you, hey, you have a VM here. You can just run everything within that VM. So a mismatch can happen, but there is still some restrictions. Say you have a container that was built for Server 2019. You can't take that and run it on a Windows Server 2016 host. Microsoft says, no, we're not, we're not going to allow that. So that's some restrictions that folks are going to have to live with. So I've been saying container kernel images. And you must be all wondering, like, what is going on here? Why is there, why am I even talking about a kernel when it comes to a container image? To explain that, let's first start with what Microsoft decided to do to help their application developers containerize their uh, software. They said, we'll give you a set of base images because what happens with Windows applications is that they depend on a whole bunch of user mode um, APIs. So everything that you require to run your application is not provided by the kernel, like it happens in the monolithic Linux kernel. Uh, the Windows kernel is split into pieces. You have the kernel DLL that runs in, you know, um, uh, in the most privileged mode, and then a lot of the other services are actually provided by user mode uh, DLLs. So they said, we'll give you these uh, base images, which is the building block for all your containers. So you have to start from one of these base images. So how do you pick one of these base images? It basically really depends on your application. Say you want to write a, you have a traditional .NET application. You're going to say, oh, I'm going to use Windows Server Core. Say you have a more complex application that requires the full set of Windows APIs that's out there. Then you would pick the Windows version of this container image. And they also have something called IoT Core. If you're writing an IoT app, you would typically use this. The reason for all this is actually, so I was mentioning these um, DLLs that run in user mode. There's a very tight coupling between those libraries and the kernel. And to make things worse, that ABI is not public and it's not stable. So there's a lot of reverse engineering that happens to discover those ABIs, but if you take advantage of it and you decide to use it, there is no, Microsoft says we give you no guarantees that we'll honor those ABIs because you're not supposed to use it. So because of this sort of tight coupling between those user mode libraries and kernel, you have to be careful about what image that you pick when you are containerizing your application. The other advantage is, the other reason for having a kernel is because of Hyper-V isolation, you're running in a VM. If you want to run in a VM, you have to boot from a kernel. So end result, your container image not only contains your application and any libraries that it needs, it also needs the kernel in there. So it comes uh, you know, sort of with the game if you're running Windows applications. Now that I have the kernel in there, these user mode libraries that my application depends on, you can take the most basic Windows image out there and you're gonna find that it has a pretty large disk footprint. And this can actually cause problems in the Kubernetes uh, uh, space because what happens is you have the kubelet that runs inside a Windows node and you try to launch an application that's bringing down a 10, 10, 10 GB uh, container image, the kubelet after a while will say, hey, you know what, I've been waiting for too long, I think there's something going on wrong, uh, I'm gonna stop trying. So you have to do something smart, you either increase the timeout that the kubelet will wait in these scenarios, or you have to preheat or pre-download those, down, uh, docker, uh, those container images upfront. The other quirk with Windows container images is that it doesn't support the latest stack. So you have to be specific. If you want to use a Windows Server core, you have to specify a tag that says, I don't know, I think the, the tag is LPSE 2019, which indicates that this is a 2019 instance of Windows Server core. And they have similar ones for, you know, if you want to run uh, Windows Server 2016 uh, container. So yeah, that's another difference that you would have to get used to in this world. All right, so now let's get on to a, a more targeted uh, talk about what we are doing with Windows workloads in OpenShift. The, quest, the question many people ask me is like, why are you doing this? Like, we are Red Hat, like, 
why do we need, why do we care about Windows? And what's this whole relationship with Microsoft? Well, the answer is customers. Customers have basically come and told us that, hey, we have large Windows applications, large .NET applications that we would love to run in OpenShift because we like what you did with our Linux applications. We were able to manage and orchestrate all of that using OpenShift and we love it. We want to do the same for our Windows applications. So that's why uh, the Windows container team was formed within OpenShift and we have started going down this path of saying, hey, what's the best way of enabling Windows workloads within OpenShift? So our initial target was you know, we wanted to start very simple. We wanted to hit just the basics, just enough so that we can say that, hey, you know, we are, we are getting our feet wet in this whole uh, new sort of environment. So the first thing we want to do is you take a Windows Server instance that's running somewhere, and then you'd say, hey, I want to add this to my OpenShift cluster. This is sort of our model that we call bring your own host model, which means that the, the customer is basically in charge of creating this Windows VM. They'll create the Windows VM, they'll uh, install the container runtime in it, they'll typically attach it to the cluster VPC or the cluster network, and then we can add it to our, uh, add it to the cluster. And to start things off, we, we decided to only support process isolation, and that's because if you want to do Hyper-V isolation, it means you need virtualization support. And in many clouds, that means you need to turn on nested virtualization. So we do not want to go down that path yet. And so to, to kick things off, we are only going to deal with uh, process isolation in the short term. And then, of course, once you have the node attached to a OpenShift cluster, we want to, of course, deploy a workload to the Windows worker node. And the way we do this is how do you differentiate between nodes, right? You have Linux workers, you have Windows workers. What we do is when, you, when we bring up the node, we apply a taint to that node, and then we tell people who want to run a pod on that node or a deployment, you say in the pod spec, you say that you can tolerate this taint so that you get targeted um, scheduling happening on those Windows nodes only. So you don't have this confusion of a Linux workload trying to land on the Windows node and, and, and dying. Um, the other key difference here is you cannot use the default OpenShift SDN network type if you want to run Windows workloads on that, uh, in that environment. Uh, because what they do in that case is they are actually, we are actually carving out a piece of the network for Windows, um, uh, what do you call, communication. And this was done not just by Red Hat. We have a partnership with Microsoft. So the OpenShift SDN team worked closely with uh, Microsoft to get all these, all these pieces in place. And where the Windows container team comes here is we don't really develop the networking side. We just glue those pieces together. And then, of course, you want to be able to route traffic between pods. This is both Linux and Windows pods, and Windows and Windows pods. And then, of course, route traffic to application users who actually want to use the service that's running inside the Windows node. So this is our architecture. And we, since we wanted to start really simple, what we decided to do was we'll write an Ansible playbook that is going to initialize the preparation of this Windows VM. And the way it does it is there's a bunch of binaries that is needed for this process. It's going to go and pull those binaries from a release location and then copy those binaries to the Windows VM, and then launch it in whatever manner that is required. One of these binaries that gets copied over is what we call the Windows machine config bootstrapper. It's a one-time use binary in the sense that it's not a daemon or something that runs in the background. You execute it once, it's going to come up, it's going to do some configuration, and then it's going to go away. And what this model allows us to do is you can even look at this and say, okay, I can now just take that playbook and convert it into an operator if I want to in the future. But for the sake of simplicity, and because there are so many unknowns in this, 
in this space, we decided to take this approach. So let's now talk a little bit about some of those pieces. So one of these pieces is the Windows machine config bootstrapper. Now this is the binary that we're gonna copy onto the Windows node by the playbook and then it's going to do some stuff. So what does it do? It's going to take the worker ignition. Worker ignition is, you can think of it as a packaged um, file that contains some information that's pertinent to that cluster. And so some of the things we extract out of that worker ignition package is the kubelet configuration. I do want to call out that we're just doing this for the time being. Uh, moving forward, we're going to construct our own kubelet configuration, which is very specific to Windows. We also, what we get from the worker ignition is we get cube configs. We actually get a couple of them. We get what's called the bootstrap cube config to bootstrap the node, and then we get the main cluster cube config because there are some dependencies on those cube configs by some other pieces of the software that we have inside that node. And of course, we need certs, so we pull them all out. And then what the uh, WMCB does is it configures and runs the kubelet as a window service. This is sort of the first step in saying, hey, you know, I'm now joining the cluster and you can start deploying applications to me. And as part of this configuration, we tell the kubelet, hey, you know, apply these taints to the nodes that you're gonna bring up. And if you remember in, in the last few slides, I had said we apply those taints because it's the taint that's going to tell us, okay, this is a Windows node, so when you write your part spec or your deployment spec, you're gonna say, hey, you should be able to tolerate this taint, and that will cause your application to land on the right node. The other piece of work that the Windows Machine Config Bootstrapper does is configure the container native interface, the CNI, and that's required for you know, networking. How all of this is tied together is by the Windows Scale-Up Playbook. Like I had mentioned before, it downloads all the required binaries from the release location, the WMCB, and the, the way the Ansible Playbook is written is a part of it will execute on the Ansible host, mainly to download some of these binaries, but there's also part of it that will actually run on the Windows VM. And things like getting the worker ignition, you can't do that from outside the cluster, you have to do it from something within the cluster. So we grab the worker ignition file on the Windows node itself. We also pull the kubelet from an upstream location and copy that over. And then we also copy this binary called the hybrid overlay. The hybrid overlay is what configures the plumbing that's needed for networking to work for Windows within that cluster. This is a piece of software that was actually written by someone from Microsoft. So shout out to Jocelyn, who helped us a lot here. And this was done in conjunction with folks from our OpenShift uh, SDN team. Shout out to Dan Williams and, and Jacob for helping out with this. And the hybrid overlay, once it runs, it means that the basic HNS, which is the host networking services pieces in Windows, is, is ready. You have your OpenShift networks created within that Windows node. And at that moment, what happens is we can go to the next step of asking the kubelet to be configured to work with CNI, which I'm gonna call out right after this. The other binary that we download is the kube proxy. I'll talk about this in the next slide. And of course, when I was talking about network configuration, there's the CNI package that needs to be done. So it collects all these files and then it copies them over to the Windows node. Once the files are copied, it starts to remotely execute these files. It first says, okay, hey, WNCB, go configure the kubelet. It then launches the hybrid overlay. Hybrid overlay talks to HNS, does all the network plumbing that's, that's required. As I said, the OpenShift HNS networks are created at this point. And now we have a second step with the WMCB, the Windows Machine Config Bootstrapper, which then runs to configure CNI, which is a container native um, interface. For this, we sort of relaunch the kubelet with added options for configuring CNI plugins. And then the kube proxy is run. Kube proxy exists for 
uh, on the Linux side too, but it's sort of an optional component. But with Linux, while it's optional, with Windows, it's required. If you do not run QProxy on your Windows node, you will not be able to allow an application to talk to the outside world. So say you create a Kubernetes service that's running behind a load balancer. If you want that load balancer to be reached by the outside world, you need this QProxy piece uh, running there because it's the piece that is maintaining all the network rules that allows off-cluster communication. The other thing that happens when the WMCB is configuring the kubelet in the first step is the node will start to like, generate certs, CS call uh, certificate signing requests, and somebody needs to sign those requests and approve them so that the node can then, you know, the cluster can say, okay, you are a valid uh, node and you can join the cluster. So the scale-up playbook also takes care of, you know, approving those certs. All right, so now comes the sort of the exciting and a little scary part of the, <laughs> the talk for me is the demo. I've been, I've been praying to the network gods, the demo gods. They have not been happy with me today morning. I was trying this out, and the network here is a little flaky. I do have a backup uh, video to show, but it's not that exciting. So I'm going to give it a shot, you know, fingers crossed, and we'll see if it works. And I'm going to sit for this. There's no way I can stand and do this. Sorry, folks. All right. Uh... So what I did is to make the, the network's life easier, I brought up a instance on AWS where I'm going to run all, where I'm going to run the playbook. The reason for doing this is the network is so slow, I need to download these binaries, copy them over, and it was like, you know, most of the time I tried it with the local network, it was timing out. So before we go down this path, let me show you something about the cluster. So the cluster that I'm running is a OpenShift latest and greatest uh, nightly version 4.4. The you can see that the list of nodes that I have at the moment. Um, we have a bunch of workers and master nodes. No uh, no Windows nodes yet. What else can I show you? Um, I also want to show you the the host file that I'm going to pass on to the Ansible playbook. This basically lists what the address of the Windows node is and the admin password. Um, you, you're free to copy the admin password because I'm going to kill this whole cluster the minute this talk is done. Uh, so we have all those pieces uh, ready, and the next step is going to be uh, running this playbook. So let's go ahead and do that. So what I have here is I'm passing the host file to the main uh, playbook, which is, we've called it main.yaml. It has a list of tasks there. And one of the things we pass on to that is the location of the WMCB that we want to use. There are two ways this playbook can run. One is you can either execute the, uh, you can execute the playbook in such a way if you have Go configured, it can actually pull the, Windows machine config operator by, uh, repository and do the build for you and then run. But you know we don't want all customers to have to do this, so you can even pass a release location that, we, that you have, and it'll pull it, pull it down and, and you know, use that binary instead. So let's kick off this run. And as you can see, one of the things it's actually doing now is it's downloading the binary um, so this is going to take, I don't know, hopefully five or 10 minutes. So what I'm going to do in that meanwhile is keep going with my presentation and then we can, we can sort of come back to this. All right, so how do I get back to my presentation? Ah, here it is. I'm also going to, I also should talk about what I'm trying to show in the demo, right? So I'm going to be running on OpenShift a 4.4 cluster that I, like I showed you. It's configured with OVN hybrid networking. I already have a Windows Server 2019 instance running on AWS. And that's the host file that I showed you. It had information about that particular instance. And that instance was connected to the cluster's uh, VPC. 
Now, in the background, what we've been seeing is that instance is added to the cluster by running the WSU playbook. Hopefully, it'll succeed. And if it succeeds, we'll get to play some Pac-Man. So it's a short and simple, hopefully short and simple demo. Hopefully, it'll work. Um, and if the demo doesn't work, I do have a link to a video that'll show you the whole thing, but that's not so exciting. And while the demo is running, I do want to talk about what the team is thinking about next steps. We do want to move to an operator model. We do want to move away from just running the Ansible playbook. We want to make it much easier for customers to gain access to running Windows workloads. We do not want them to go through the pain of creating a Windows VM, installing the required runtime in there. We want to actually take over most of those pieces. And the easiest way to do that is actually move to the operator model. It will streamline that whole uh, process for us. At the same time, what we have at the moment is just basic functionality as far as running Windows workloads goes, as I described before. So in addition to that, OpenShift has amazing logging functionality. So we want to actually plug in into that so that you know, Windows and Linux, they're on the same uh, plane as far as uh, OpenShift goes. The same goes for monitoring. Uh, we have a monitoring framework that's part of the cluster. We do want to plug into that so that no one is going to say that, oh, I'm not able to get certain features that's present for Linux, but is not present for Windows. The other thing that we want to do is container native storage. We want to add support for that. And the way we want to do that is uh, Red Hat has a container uh, native storage team that does take care of storage. They would do some of those pieces. We would be the glue. And hopefully, we'll get some traction from either Microsoft or somewhere upstream that will help with some of the bits in Windows that is needed here. So this is what the operator architecture is going to look like as we move forward. So we're going to have what we will, what we're going to most likely call Windows machine config operator. And what that operator is going to do is going to watch for a couple of uh, resources. One is we will create a Windows operator CRD. CRD is a custom resource definition. It's a way to extend the Kubernetes API for different applications. So we'll create our own CRD, which we'll call Windows operator. And that's basically going to describe most, at the, at the moment, we think it's going to just describe the release binaries that need to be used, that you need to go and uh, pull from external sources. Then what will happen is it's also going to watch for uh, machine objects. Machine objects is something very OpenShift specific. It's an object that describes uh, worker nodes and, and ma master nodes. So we would add some features to that uh, machine object that indicates that this is a Windows worker. And then the operator is actually going to sit and watch for that particular object to see if that object has been created or not. The reason for doing that is the minute that object gets created, we know a Windows VM has appeared on the cluster, and, and it's wanting to join the cluster. In addition to the object being created, it's also going to give us a way to get the, the admin password of that Windows VM, because it's not that easy to use keys to get to the Windows node, so we'll most likely you know, do some further implementation to the machine API that's part of OpenShift that will give us access to the secret in, you know, in Kubernetes uh, terms in, the, in like a, a secret CR. And so we'll use that secret, and then we're pretty much going to do exactly what we did using the Ansible playbook. We're going to copy the binaries over, run WMCB. So this is why I was saying that if you look at the original picture, you could have taken that Ansible playbook and just dropped in this... Uh, operator and everything should have still worked. So hopefully that's the model we are shooting for. Uh, I have actually rushed through my presentation, so let's go back to the demo and see if it's still working. Awesome, it did not work. <laughs> 
so what would have actually happened is actually the place where it failed is it was trying to uh, launch the hybrid overlay. And for some reason, there was an issue there. But what would have happened is I'll quickly run through what happens with the demo. So what I'm actually showing here is I'm basically showing the cluster version like I showed before. I'm going to show you uh, the list of nodes here. And actually, what I, I, did, I did miss showing you one of those things. This is the network configuration. And you can see the type is OVN Kubernetes. And we also have to change what we call the network operator to make it a, a hybrid uh, OVN version. And once this needs to be done upfront before adding the Windows node, these are the nodes that are already existing. Um, this is, again, like I mentioned before, is the host file that you pass on to the Ansible playbook. And again, we're going to kick off and run the Ansible playbook here. So I'll quickly go through what the playbook is doing. Like I mentioned before, it's, it, download, it downloads the WMCB from a a release location. It then also picks up the, uh, the kubelet node binary. And then from within the kubelet node binary, it takes the kubelet.exe and downloads it locally. It also gra grabs the, the kube proxy binary that is required. And then it goes and fetches the uh, CNI plugins. That's basically a tar GC file, which is then unzipped and will be moved over. And then what it does is it starts to copy these required files onto the Windows node. And that's the thing that takes a bunch of time. So I can sort of speed that up a little bit. And here it's trying to get the ignition file. And once it gets the ignition file, it also needs to figure out what cube version the cluster is using so that it, it uses the right kubelet binary and it pulls the right kubelet binary. Um, once it finishes doing that, it's going to pull the hybrid overlay, make sure that the hybrid overlay is SHA matches, and then the first step is it's going to run the bootstrapper. Once the first bootstrapper op operation is done by the WMCB, it's going to generate a CSR. So what the playbook will do at that point is it's going to wait for some time for the CSR to show up in the cluster. And the minute it finds that the CSR is, is present, it's going to approve it. And then it's going to wait for the next step, where once the uh, bootstrap CSR has been approved, it, another CSR gets generated, which is the node CSR. And now it's going to approve that too. And these are key factors for sort of you know, authenticating that this node is allowed to join the, the cluster. And once the CSRs have been applied, the first part of you know, bootstrapping this Windows instance is done. And the rest of the work that happens beyond this point is mainly networking. Um, so as you can see here, the, the bootstrap node has been uh, applied. The CSRs have been approved. And now it starts to do the networking pieces. The first thing it does is it checks if the hybrid overlay is already running. The reason why it's doing this is it's ensuring that this playbook can be run over and over again against the same Windows instance without any issues. Once the hybrid overlay is up and running, you can start doing the CNI configuration. The CNI configuration actually uses some of the annotations that the hybrid overlay, once it finishes running, applies to the node object. So it takes some information from there, creates the CNI configuration, and then it reruns WMCB with a different set of options. And those set of options is what applies the CNI command line parameters to the kubelet. And then the kubelet starts to run in, in, in its final state as a service. And once that's done, it, the next step is it has to configure the kube proxy that I spoke about so that it allows external network communication to happen. 
And then the SKU proxy, what it does is, once that's configured as a Windows service, that's pretty much all the work that the um, WMCB has to do. And you will see now that the Windows node has been added. And if you describe the node, you will see that it's, it says the OS image being used is Windows Server 2019. And you know the kubelet has started, the, the Q proxy has started, and at this point, you can actually um, add Windows workloads onto this instance. So Windows workload, which what I was hoping to show, would look something like the following. So if you look at this um, YAML, we have a service that is, reg that is a, basically a regular Kubernetes service. There's no difference here if you compare it to a um, Linux service. The key difference is going to be on the deployment side where you will describe things like I'm looking for that. Um, so as you can see here, see the image that's being used is a Windows Server Core image, and this is the tag I was talking about before. You have to specify an LTSE 2019 sort of tag, otherwise uh, things won't work. Uh, this is the command that's gonna be passed to, this is gonna be the command that's gonna be passed to this Windows Server Core um, instance. And the other thing that I was talking to you about was the toleration that it needs to be specified. And so we say that, oh, the key that we're looking for is OS and the value is Windows, so that's a toleration um, that maps to the uh, taint that we have applied to the node. And the same thing, we also have a node selector here where we mention what uh, OS type is done. So the end of this, if we were able to uh, launch this uh, uh, what do you call, launch this deployment, you would be able to access this uh, Windows service from an external source. So that's pretty much all I have. I was hoping to show more if the cluster actually came up, but unfortunately it did not. Not the cluster, but the node. So let's go back to my slides. Hmm. I can try. In fact, I, I can just run it in the background while I can maybe open up the floor for questions. All right, so while this is running, uh, so this is not G8. This is not even like available for tech preview at the moment or dev preview. This is something that the team is playing around with and working out. We might pass it on to certain you know, solution architects to see if they can you know, show this off to customers, but we're not planning on releasing this um, anytime soon. More work needs to be done to stabilize it, make it more feature perfect, and make it on par with uh, Linux workloads. So we're not ready to GA uh, this. This is, I don't know, what, what, what we can call this very early alpha or preview type things that we you know, want to start, get a, get a head start on this. Uh, so at this point, I think the floor is uh, open to questions. If anyone has, yeah. What about the licensing? So the question was, what about the licensing for the Windows? So if you remember very early on, we had said that this is going to be sort of a bring your own host model. So the licensing is sort of on the customer. If they have a Windows license, they can use it or, you know, pay AWS or Azure for those licenses. And so we don't want to be taking ownership of paying for those licenses either. So it's mostly on the customer side as far as things like licensing goes. Sure. So the, that's the area that we have not even touched so far. At the moment, whatever default uh, that the container runtime is, is using, we're just going with it. but. That's another piece we need to work with the uh, OpenShift storage team to figure out. And I did forget to mention something about container runtimes. At the moment, we're using Docker, because that's what the, like, you can find uh, instance uh, AMIs on Amazon 
provided by Microsoft that's having the Docker runtime, but the plan upstream is to go with uh, ContainerD, Cry ContainerD as their runtime. And what Microsoft is saying is with, in the whole Kubernetes uh, space, they're gonna go with Cry ContainerD and they will only support Hyper-V isolation. So we do have to think about what we're gonna do at that point. We might have to use some of the i3 instances on AWS that provides uh, uh, what, what is called, um, uh, what is that called? Uh, nested virtualization. Uh, there, there are these instances called Nitro instances where Amazon uses their own version of the hypervisor to allow nested virtualization to happen in a more uh, performant manner. So we, we do have to think about those things. Um, yeah, so this is, this is a problem that you're seeing that it's looking for a CSR and not being able to find. So I think running the playbook, the CSR has already been approved. So we actually, um, hopefully it'll ignore, I think I'm using a version of our, of our playbook that's actually gonna ignore the, the CSR. Any, any more questions? Okay, so the question was, what are you gonna do in an offline environment, right? Because we're downloading these libraries from release locations, what are we gonna do in, in that scenario? The answer is, when we go to the operator model, we're gonna have a source of truth within the cluster itself. Because we don't wanna keep using different binaries that you know, haven't been certified and things like that. So most of the binaries that we require will come from within the cluster itself. So that way you don't have to reach outside and, and pull these things. They'll be all packaged as part of the operator. So when you run the operator, you, you basically have it. All right, so the question was, is this OpenShift specific or are we planning to make this part of upstream? So if the question is about the playbook and things like that, that's very OpenShift specific. We are only planning to use that against OpenShift clusters. It's very sort of you know, tuned so that it makes it easy in an OpenShift way. But there is nothing preventing us from modifying that playbook to make it upstream friendly too. There's nothing you know, we're not doing anything funky or special there. This could easily be uh, adopted for upstream use cases. The thing with upstream use cases is we need to figure out what the networking model is gonna be there. It could be anything, right? Here we're being a little um, prescriptive saying that we will only support a certain networking model that we're familiar with. So as we start supporting different networking models, uh, that will become an easier thing for us to support in the upstream. Any more questions? The other thing I, let me quickly go back to my slides. So actually the, the piece that I was saying might be a problem is actually not a problem. The, I was using the latest and greatest of the playbook so that actually uh, figures out that okay, this is actually a node that we have already uh, approved so it's sort of ignoring that whole process and it's gonna keep going. But I think the place it's gonna fail is the hybrid overlay which means there's some networking funkiness that is happening on the cluster, which is what I was running into earlier uh, in the morning. Um, so I'm not so confident that'll, that'll work, but we'll see. But I'm trying to get back to my slides. I have a couple of more things that I could show in this time. Was there somebody? Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, that's a good question. I actually haven't thought about OKD, but I would say that if you're able to do this against OCP, you should be able to do it against 
OK, D, I can't think of anything that would prevent us from being able to use this with OK, D. So it should be there. Um, all right, let me try, see if I can get back to my slides. I have actually lost my slides. No, I'm, I'm still running Fedora. That's it's one thing to say that I'm working on Windows is another thing to say that I'm going to run Windows on my laptop. <laughs> uh, there it is. Yeah, I just wanted to show what I think our yeah, so these are the couple of um, uh, links that I've put out there. One is for our repo, which is the Windows Machine Config Operator. We're calling it the Windows Machine Con Config Operator. It'll soon be renamed to Windows Machine Config Bootstrapper, and we're going to start afresh when we go down the operator model. SIG Windows is the special interest group in Kubernetes for upstream work. So if any of you folks are interested in contributing in this, in this, in this space, please join SIG Windows. They have a Slack channel on the Kubernetes Slack. There are also weekly meetings where people discuss about work that's happening in this area. So really useful. I highly suggest folks interested in Windows workloads to go and try this out. And of course, I have to put in a little bit of a, you know, a plug for Red Hat, right? We are hiring. We're hiring all over the world. In particular, the Windows container team is hiring in Boston. So if someone wants to work out of Boston, you know, come and look me up uh, after. Uh, and I'm willing to take in your resume. Um, so that was my plug. If I have a little bit more time, I had a couple of slides that I thought wouldn't make it. I'm also, yeah, so it failed at the, at the same spot, trying to uh, configure the hybrid overlay. So I must have done something wrong, maybe, or there's some networking glitch happening at the moment. But sorry, folks, that I couldn't show you a live enough uh, demo. Sure. Do you know of any other efforts to run Windows workloads on Kubernetes? So Rancher has come out with a release. Oh, okay. uh, so has AWS. It's all, again, just like us, very early. They're not you know, putting any support statements out there. So very early in the game. And that's why I think we're also getting involved as quickly as we can, because we sort of want to get up to speed before the rest of the industry catches up. So the question was, is Microsoft Azure doing it? No. <laughs> not yet, at least. They might have plans to release it, but not yet. I was going to show some more slides, but I think I'm slowly running out of time. Um, so yeah, there's five minutes. I could maybe show those slides. They're more of um, historical interest. I'd actually hidden them. I mean, this is just to show you the kind of evolution that's been happening in the Windows Server space. Microsoft started with Windows Server 2016, where they started to introduce uh, process isolation, Hyper-V isolation. They had like a built-in Docker for Windows Server. They slowly moved, and you know, in the next step, which was I think 1709, they came out with these container images for Nano Server and Server Core. They also had like platform level support for Linux containers, so you can theoretically run Linux containers on a Windows <laughs> node, but it actually, again, happens way within a machine. That is something that we're not really looking at, at least with an OpenShift. If someone wants to run a Windows work, uh, Linux workload, you just run it on a Linux worker node. And they did the same uh, by the time they got to server 2019 is where they had more of the networking pieces in place, more of the, the container storage pieces in place. They also added support for some of the networking plugins like Calico and Flannel. So in fact, if you go look upstream, you would see that all the networking stuff is done through uh, Flannel. But 
we decided to go the, the hybrid route. Um, if you want technical details and more architecture about the networking stuff, you should ping the SDN team. So while they were doing this evolution on the Windows server side, you know, the same sort of evolution was happening in the Kubernetes uh, area too. I know this infograph kind of throws a lot of information out there. It's more to just show you the kind of stuff they were doing over a time frame. So this stops, I think, at 113, and we're like at 118 or 119 now at this point. But so they've been working on this almost since the 1.8 or 1.6 time frame. So Microsoft has been pretty hard at work in trying to you know, enter this whole container and, and Kubernetes orchestration space for a while. All right, so that's pretty much all I had. I, again, apologize for not being able to show a live demo. Um, I think I sort of asked for a little too much trying to add a node live. <laughs> um, but hopefully, maybe it found a bug in our code, so it's all good. All right, if nothing else, thank you, folks.